Hey guys, how's everyone doing there today? So um, it's Friday, it's Fun Day Friday. And in this broadcast today, we're going to be talking about energy efficient appliances. We've got winter coming up. So I want to cover a few things that I've been asked this week from people looking to go off grid and design energy efficient homes and building new homes. And so the, the first part we're going to cover in some cooking appliances and some really good energy efficient cooking appliances. And then also I'm going to touch on the end of Energy efficiency, the best way to think about it is if you can use the same source of heat, we'll use as an example. I'm in Australia here, we've got winter coming up. I know for you guys in the States, you're going into summer. Uh, winter is a really good way of really easily explaining and trying to heat your home and recovering that energy and reusing energy. So, and how many different ways you can use it. So I'm going to talk about some ways here. I know you guys in the States are probably thinking, oh, it's just it's getting hotter. You're getting out of winter. You're pretty excited. Here in Australia, I'm pretty pumped. Um, the principal at my kid's school gives me a hard time about wearing my Ugg boots in winter. <laughs> and uh, today, I put my Ugg boots on. So I've got my Ugg boots on. I'm pretty excited about. It's a bit chilly here in Lismore. And I've got to, to go. So, um, so yeah. So we'll just check, guys. If everyone, anyone can let me know out there that, the audio is working well, and I'll actually share my screen. We don't want to start like last week. Um, so someone just posted in the comments and just let me know that if you know you can hear me and you can see my screen, that would be great. Cool. So um, yeah. So we'll start with some um, some cooking, some cooking appliances. Now, for me. Thanks, Trisha, for letting us know. Brad Thornton, all good. Thanks for letting us know. Everything's working out there. So, um, yeah, we'll start with induction cooktop. I'm a big fan. When I first built my first off-grid house in the middle of Sydney, we used gas as cooking because the house already had it. And we had gas hot water backup as a booster and we had gas heating in the house. Now, we actually had a really small gas usage. Um, we wanted to go fully electric was the plan, and we did. And I will show you how we did it with a couple of these little energy efficient appliances that we used. When I built our next house, when we, we sold up in Sydney, we moved up to Lismore, we wanted to go all electric and proper all electric. And these induction cooktops is one of the things. My wife, she's an amazing cook, and she was really didn't want to use induction and was, was completely against it. Once she got onto it, she realized how controllable it is and she would never go back. So it's one of those things with induction cooking is, re is really energy efficient. And these bench top ones, the reason I bring those up shows what we did in Sydney when we took our house off grid. Like I said, the house had um, gas and I, I purchased one of these purely to get Sarah to try it out and give it a go. One of the problems back in the days, and we're talking like 2013, 14 back here, um, we got involved and I brought one of these induction cooktops. So with the induction cooktop and being a cheap bench top one back then in the days, they were really hard to control and to use. And I'll give you an example, like the one in my car I've got, um, it pretty much just comes on flat out. So a lot of them these days you can buy, uh, a lot more controllable and a lot more usable um, to make them more energy efficient. And so if you're on a small off-grid system and you might have gas there as your backup, and in the good weather, you might use one of these induction cooktops. And look, it's one of those things that I highly recommend. Just buy one, try it. Um, the, my favorite one's a brand called New Wave. Um, we, they're really hard to find here in Australia. In the States, they're everywhere. They're a really big brand in Australia. They've been my favorite to use and to have a play around with. Uh, really easy to control and things like that. But induction cooktop, I'm a big fan of it. And you know, for those gas lovers out there, I know a lot of people love gas. It's one of those things, like I said, my wife will never go back to gas after using one of these, how controllable they are with electric. And that's one of the uh, huge advantages with electric. So so we stopped using the gas cooktop. We had one of these. And the other thing as well, my wife hates things on benches. She likes, um, you know, in our forever home, she wants one of those kitchens where you can pull everything down and hide everything so you can't see anything on a bench. Um, just to, so, um, so, yeah, so they're... She did doesn't like things on benches and bench tops. So that's sort of the downside of one of these things. But if you are off grid and have a small solar system, we have a lot of customers that I'll just talk some financials here. We have a lot of people out there that spent ten to fifteen thousand dollars on a solar system completely off grid. And they use one of these induction cooktops on a really small, you know, low cost solar system off grid, which is pretty cool. Um 
Now, the next thing when we talk about energy efficient appliances is turbo ovens. One of these here, what makes them really energy efficient is the small space, so actually only heating up a small space. They're really fast. So you can cook a chicken in one of these things in about 40 minutes and they're really good. I've, I've done this salted chicken before. Uh, it's one of those contradictory things. You think salt, you know, reduce, pulls out the moisture. And it's actually one of the most moist things I've ever cooked in my life. Uh, it's actually amazing uh, doing these salt chickens, these turbo ovens. are really fast because it's a small space you're heating up and they use a little bit of energy. So don't pull so much. The downside is to them, one thing my wife hates about these things is she can't actually fit all the cooktops in them, the square pans. And, you know, we, we brought these a long time ago and um, we actually have a newer one, which um, Easy Cook uh, is the one in Australia. Yep, this is an Australian brand. They used to make them here in Australia. They don't anymore, um, but they're an Australian company. They sort of started this turbo oven, um, Easy Cook things. And the one we got, the newer model one, it's actually smaller, which is annoying. These glass ones are great. I really wish they made a little bench top one like the newer one. The newer one's got some insulation on the outside, which makes it more energy efficient. It's just smaller. And as an example for me, using cooking with this, I'll give you an example that basically what I used to do in Sydney, I would throw, you know, some bacon and a few things and onions and stuff like that in the pan, get that on cranking. I'd walk down the back, go get my eggs from the chickens, come back up, crack the eggs in there, and you can do all your bacon egg breakfast in one of these things and using that one thing, one pot wonder to do everything and it's really energy efficient because instead of you know sometimes cooking eggs is probably not a good thing but you can cook a lot of things multiply in these devices and what you're doing because you're using one device to do several different things it's going to really help you save energy rather than have two things running if you can combine them one of my customers uh he went to the extremes in this here and i love this product i actually want to buy one i was going to google it today and, and show you guys but he actually purchased a um little coffee maker, water, little kettle, boil water. And in the bottom, it boils water. And in the top, it actually has an egg holder. So you can actually throw your eggs in the top there and actually cook your eggs. So while you're boiling your water, the top's cooking your eggs. So it's sort of using that same heat, same energy to do the one thing, which is really, really energy efficient. Now, another question I got to talk today is, is um, this week, someone actually asked me about slow cookers and they said they were a really big fan of them and they didn't use them. They were talking about their caravan motorhome setup. They said they didn't use them because they're really, they were scared that they used a lot of energy. Now, we actually did some studies. Uh, actually, this week just worked out perfect timing. If you want to follow me on Instagram, Instagram where we post a lot of comments and a lot of educational things of data. So I do a lot of photos over there. And this week we talked about slow cookers and we did a, did a consumption monitoring. So we monitored how much power that, that drew. So it drew 300 watts, well, two to 300 watts it draws while it's actually drawing. And the whole day it was on to cook a curry, it used 1.6 kilowatt hours. So that's how much power we, how much energy we used over the day. We only used 1.6 kilowatt hours. So from a financial point of view, if we had to buy the energy from the grid, it would cost about 30 cents for the day to use a slow cooker all day. So they're really, really energy efficient uh, in that point of view. So, and coming into winter, this is what, you know, for me, cooking soups, cooking curries, all that sort of stuff, slow cookers are really good because of a day in your solar system, you're sort of not using your ovens and things like that overnight and really hammering your batteries when you're off-grid. You're using these appliances of a day when the sun shines out in winter. You know, you can easily cook a roast or you can do some veggies and stuff like that in a six-hour period, slow cooking of a day while the sun's out. And that's really going to help turn your solar system into that, you know, of a night time where it's just running your lights, your TVs and fridges. You're not really pulling any big loads and things like that on it, um, which is great. With, with slow cookers. So I'd highly recommend if you're off grid or you just want to be energy efficient, get a slow cooker. They're great and uh, they use very, very little energy. And like I said, if you want to follow us at Mike at the off grid coach over on Instagram, we post a lot of photos and data and all that sort of stuff. And, and the other thing as well we're doing is uh, we'll put the link in in the chat and in the description is we're actually running a competition on a weekly basis. So you get to win some free merch. So um, you see some of the crazy shirts I wear and jumpers for Australia. We just had a had a whole new heap of jumpers put up on the website. If you want to try and support the channel, you can actually go over and buy that stuff. What we're going to be doing uh, on YouTube, we're going to be running a quiz each week. So after we run this live stream on a weekly basis, we're going to launch a quiz. And then the following week, we're going to release a winner. So you're going to have to be subscribed on YouTube to comment, like, and that sort of stuff on the YouTube and the answers. And someone that gets the questions right is going to 
win uh, win some merch. So, uh, and the, the answer is going to be given away in these live streams. So, check out those live streams. Um, okay, so Busman has got a a question about what does. We'll just pop that up. Got two screens going on here, guys. Um, what does one point six kilowatt hours translate out of a battery? And that's a very very good question. So I'm actually going to show you. Oh, there we go. We lost audio. Apologies, guys. Um, my audio dropped out there. I'll just quickly recover that. So basically, um, 1.6 kilowatt hours, which is 1,600 watt hours. We divide that by the battery wattage. So we divide that by 12. We need 133 amp hours of battery capacity. So you'd probably want a 150 amp hour battery if you're going to do that and, and do that cook out of that there, if that makes sense. Um, thanks for letting us know that we lost audio, bus man. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so you relate everything back to, I always work everything at kilowatt hours. So it's always volts times amps equals watts. And then you add your time and you're going to get that, get that calculation. So yeah, I'd always work everything out to your kilowatt hours or kilowatts, so you can do those calculations. And it's any battery voltage, you always, if it's a 48 volt battery, you'd take 48 volt times the amp hours. And say, for example, it's a 48 battery with 100 amp hour, um, that's gonna give you 4.8 kilowatt hours of battery capacity. And uh, what's usable is gonna all come down to your, um, your battery that you've purchased. So, um, cool, awesome. Now, one of the next things we get asked a lot about, and um, yeah, so, these are a bit controversial. Uh, I'm a big fan of them. So thermomixers. Now, I personally, it's funny. A lot of um, a lot of wives try and talk their husbands or partners, whatever, into buying a um, thermomix. Where in my household, <laughs> I was the one doing the selling it, convincing my wife to say, "Hey, we want to get one of these because they're amazing from an energy efficiency point of view." Now, just on the slow cook. Like a slow cooks 1.6 kilowatt hours with thermo mixes. The rough energy consumption is about 200 watt hours to cook a meal. So every 20 minutes, so most thermo mix meals you can do in about a 20 minute um, session. So most 20 minute thermo mix meals uh, use about 200 watt hours. I've cooked a couple of their curries and things like that. The slow cooks in, in the thermo mixes and the new ones got the heating device and things like that. Uh, and they're still amazing. I think about 400 watt hours is about the most energy that we've used out of a, um, yeah, using it. And we, we've got a couple of, couple of more recipes and stuff come up come up to winter. We love using our thermo mix and that sort of stuff. If you do want to buy one, we'll put a link in the description below. Uh, there's a couple of girls that live here in Lismore and down in Coffs Harbour uh, that basically thermomix consultants is one of those things. If you want to buy one of those, you require to buy through a consultant. So we'll put the girls' links in below uh, to be able to buy those. And get hold of the thermomix, but they're amazing. And also from an energy point of view, like from my point of view is 
it's one appliance that does so many different things. Uh, like, like for me, you know, I said to my wife, one of the biggest things, the reason I wanted to get a Thermomix, besides the fact that energy efficiency, I think for a living, I spend so much time thinking when it's my turn to cook dinner, which these days is very rare, but back in back in the day in Sydney, I used to cook a lot. Um, I just didn't want to think about it. And I love about the Thermomix, you can just rock up, press a button, tell me what to cook, and it just guides you through everything so my brain can have a rest. It's been flat out since 4 a.m. in the morning, thinking about life and how to change the world and educate people about energy efficiency and passive house solar designs and all that stuff. I just want to have a break and not think about things. So I'm a really big fan of the Thermomixers. And I know for two and a half grand, they seem expensive. But when you take about all the different appliances that you actually require to buy, and I actually, I haven't had that winter since we've actually got a new one. I want to test a lot this winter and see how energy efficient all the Thermomix stuff is. So if you want to see that data, remember on Instagram, jump over to Mike at the Off Grid Coach and follow us over there. I'll be putting some pictures up of the, the meals I make and also of the... Um, of the energy consumption on this thing so you can really see them. I know the girls from Thermomix get asked a lot about can you take away caravanning and camping? And yes, you can because the way a Thermomix works is more like an induction cooktop. It really pulsates. Uh, I'll actually do a video and I'll show you the energy and how it works of how it turns on and then off and then on, then off, then on, then off. Um, so you can see, and they're really, really energy efficient. They actually don't pull a huge draw. So if you did want to put in a caravan, I'd recommend have like a 2000 watt inverter, depending on the quality. If you've got a really good quality inverter, you could probably get away with a small one. But if you get a cheap inverter, which most caravans have when these guys build their caravans, they build these amazing, you know, $100,000 caravans. They put this cheap Chinese inverter in there that does nothing. So, um, and then the poor old Thermomix or the appliance gets the bad news and, oh, I can't run this thing off grid. And it's really the crappy, the inverter in the caravan. So something to really think about. And there is a lot of, you know, it takes a lot to understand off-grid and inverter sizes and what can and can't do what. So it can be confusing. A lot of the cheap Chinese ones are a 2,000 watt one. They won't give you 2,000 watts. So I'll give it to you for a moment. Um, yeah, so it's something to, to really think about. So big, big, big fan of Thermomixers. Uh, and like I said, the link will be in the description below if you want to buy one. Uh, they, In my opinion, you know, like I said, I had to convince my wife that they're well worth it. So the next thing I want to talk about, um, they're most of the cooking appliances and it's just more about thinking about when you're cooking, can you do, and this another good thing about the Thermomix is thinking about this out loud, is they have like this Varoma feature down here, which literally down the bottom, you can cook a stew, do your pasta and have everything at the bottom. And as it's steaming up the top, you have all your veggies and stuff up top, um, or you can be, you know, making some soup or a sauce down the bottom and up the top in this Varoma, because of the heat and steam goes up the top, you can be cooking some fish, steaming some veggies and, you just use that one bit of energy to do the same thing. And that's what I want to get into. We'll talk about heating. And there's a real big push in Australia and basically worldwide to get off gas. And a lot of people think and freak out and think, oh, you know, if we all get off get off gas and go electric, can we power our lives and our houses? And look, there's a lot of conversation around that. Can the network in Australia handle everyone going to electric vehicles? And look, if we were smart about it right now, we don't need any upgrades. It's more about just using, because our network's made for peak periods between 6.30 and 7.30 at night. So the, the, the network's made to give all that energy that it can between that time. And the rest of the day, we use hardly any energy. Even though during the day when all the businesses and stuff on, we use hardly any energy. If we were smart about how we do things, you know, winter, slow cooking, things of a day, charger EVs of a day, or of a nighttime after the peak periods. I know in Queensland, uh, I think now you can't put a bigger than like a four and a half kilowatt EV charger onto your house unless it's on the off-peak circuit. So in Queensland already saying, hey, if you want to buy an electric vehicle, you cannot charge it any more than four kilowatts unless it's on, on the off-peak circuit. And that might seem like a really bad thing for us here in New South Wales. Off-peak turns on about 10 o'clock in the morning through to about two o'clock in the afternoon. And then over nighttime, it kicks on about nine o'clock and goes through at about seven o'clock in the morning. So it's there's a lot of time that the off-peak is actually turned on that circuit. It's not just overnight, you know, after midnight till two in the morning or whatever. There is actually a lot of time in New South Wales. I don't really know the times in, in Queensland. Um, so something to think about there, getting off gas. So let's talk about heating and how heating can be really efficient. Now, when we lived in Sydney, this is one of my favorite things we put in the house to make our house really energy efficient. And when we first did our house in Sydney, 
And when designing and going off grid, the hardest time of year is actually winter because we've got long nights, short days. So you've got short solar production. So you need to put as much energy as you can in your batteries and live from batteries as long as possible from an off-grid point of view. Where, you know, if you've got the grid or even if you just want to be self-sufficient, if you've got the grid or a generator backup, it's still no, no different that the fact that you're going to be using your backup source a lot more. When the grid's available, you're not really going to hear it. You're just going to pay for it. Where with a generator, you need both. You're going to hear it and you're going to pay for it. You know, if your generator's coming on in the middle of the night because you're using a ton of energy overnight. And like I said, winter and like this time of year, things are only getting worse. You know, every single day, things are going to get worse and worse and worse. All the way to the winter equinox to the middle of June. And then... Things can only go up from there. So then our solar production starts getting better and better. So it's something to think about. Now, nectar baker ovens and why these things are great. And you think about this. So when we installed this in our place in Sydney, it really helped us with our cooking because we would put on top of it. We do in the morning, I do my, you know, my breakfast and cook on top of it, heat my coffee. So the first thing in the morning, I'd get up and I pretty much wouldn't be refiring the fire. I would actually just open the, the vent, the flue on the front. And it would just crank up because overnight we'd have to turn it right down. It was actually way too hot, this thing in our house in Sydney. It was a real challenge. Uh, it was just way too efficient. Now, we'd cook our breakfast and stuff on top of it. We'd have the fire gun of a day, and that would really help heat our home. Uh, and of a day, so we, we weren't using any energy. So our, literally our solar system in winter was just lights, TVs, and fridges. And then we'd actually use the oven of a night to cook from. So because it's a wood-fired oven, cook from it. Now, one of the other things I really want to do with this here, so I hope you can see there how we're using the same energy source. So we put wood into the fire and we're using that to cook and heat the home at the same time. Now, you can actually do this with electricity. I'm going to show you in a second. Um, you can't do your cooking, but you can heat and do a few things, which I'm going to get onto in a minute. I'm going to show you a cool example on a project one of our customers actually introduced us to. Um, but we use that one wood source to heat the house and cook our breakfast. Now, the other thing I really wanted to put in this, this property here when we did a build in Sydney, see so these ovens here, is a wet back. Now, if you don't understand what a wet back is, so you've got in the back of the fireplaces, you've actually got a radiator and you actually divert your hot water. So we had, and you actually really want a solar hot water system with a tank on the roof to make this easier. Now, when we wanted to buy the wet back, the biggest problem is to find a plumber in the cities to be able to plumb this in. So... And honestly, if you're living in the city, I'd probably advise, unless you really love a fire, I love a fire, um, go all electric, which I'll get onto the story of how to make your house all electric, because it's one of those things of the cost of actually bringing wood in from the country into the city to heat your house and do all that sort of stuff in your home in, in the city can be a real challenge. And when I did the numbers, it was the same price as cooking on fire as it was to buy energy from the gas uh, in, in Sydney. So it, we did it wasn't because of a financial point of thing because we had to actually had to buy our wood and get it in or I had to go spend the whole weekend getting it and doing all that sort of stuff. So um, with the wet backs, it's about you put a radiator in the back and you've got your solar hot water and you want a thermal siphon system. So you want the, the gravity, the water to be gravity fed to come down into the radiator of the fireplace. And so you're taking that same amount of wood, which you'd be using, you will use more wood because you are doing more things with it. So you do use a little bit more wood. It's not like, you know, you don't use more wood because you're going to be then using your fireplace to cook your dinner, heat your house and heat your hot water at the same time. So this is what's been really energy efficient. So if you're off grid in the middle of nowhere, this is probably the only time I'd recommend getting a solar hot water system because the hot water of a day will get heated by the sun if the sun's out. And if that doesn't happen, you're going to boost it overnight with your hot water, with your fireplace when you're heating your house, cooking your dinner, and so we're using that one energy source to do three different things. And if I can teach you one thing out of this video, one of the most important things is actually just think about that is how you can recapture and use one energy source to do multiple things with it. So and this is a really easy way to explain and people get it. There's a lot of other different, different options, uh, you know, like an EVs now and with the Tesla electric cars, they're taking the heat from the batteries to recapture that heat, put it through the HVAC system. So the air con in the car and all these funky stuff to help really make those vehicles a lot more energy efficiency. And working on things like that is what's going to help the car get more range. And we don't need more batteries or bigger battery capacity. It's about using the energy efficiency and making the things that the car uses from the battery pack energy efficient. And that's a really good thing to talk about is we have an early Tesla. Uh, we're one of the early models. And I woke up in the middle of the night to a notification saying, hey, hurry up and plug your car into charge. Otherwise, it's not going to start in the morning. 
and our son had turned the heaters up and cranked them up last night and left the door open. So um, he literally drained the battery in our car last night uh, and it only had 30% in it and it got to 6% before I got the notification. So um, yeah, when I got up to check it, my wife had already done it. So she'd beat me to it. She'd, she'd got the notification for me. So thank you. Save me doing it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the next thing I want to talk about so is that capturing that heat. And I want to show you a project in Sydney of how these guys have done it all electric. And we actually have a customer who's off grid. And I think I, I tried to get having a conversation with him this morning. And um, yeah, basically, I was a bit late to get through and just confirm this. But um, I'll, I'll share this project with you here. Um, so these guys have done this all electric. And I'll leave the link. It's um, Stiebel Electron is the company that they're, they're, this is a project in Sydney, just so you can understand. So they're using heat pump technology. So a heat pump is based in air conditioner motor. So they've got that big aircon running outside. And what it's doing, either it's heating your hot water. So the, the, the aircon's running pretty much, you know, whenever you're running it. And what these guys are doing, taking the excess heat to heat your hot water. You can also do underfloor heating with these things here. So you actually divert it. So just think about like this. We can use the air conditioner to heat your um, hot water. Once your hot water's hot, and then they can pump it actually underground and do, you know, this is pretty much you'd want a new build to do that there. And they can heat your floor so they can store the energy away later on so your floor's hotter. Um, or if it's a retrofit, so it's probably not going to blow your floor up and put underfloor heating in there, you can actually use it to run your air conditioner and capture that extra heat during winter to heat your home. So heat pumps are a great technology where it has that anything that's like an air conditioner right now they can attach it to the one unit and you can actually use it for multiple different purposes. Now, the thing I wanted to confirm my customer this morning, I just, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I think from memory, we, we spoke about this about 12 months ago or maybe even two years ago now. I think from memory, the way his system worked is he could actually take his fireplace and the wet back from his fireplace and add into this same system. So as an example, you know, you've got your heat pump, which is your aircon, your electrical motor, and you're using energy to do that. So what he could do in winter, he could actually flick a switch and flick it to the wet back in his fireplace. So when he's running the fireplace and his house was a hemp build, I don't know if it was hemp or rammed earth. I think it might've been rammed earth. Might've been a rammed earth build, which is a really energy efficient home as well. So when they got the wet back running in winter, they flick over to the wet back. So the wet backs heating the underfloor heating in the house. It's heating the home. They can cook dinner off it and they can use it to heat their hot water. And so that you're just taking that one source of energy and doing lots and lots of things with it. So in an urban environment, if you were building a brand new build, this is something I'd go down the path. And when I do my forever home, whether it's off-grid or on-grid, and when I say off-grid or on-grid, like if it's rural or in the city, personally, myself, I like to live just on the skirts of a city or a town to be really close to the town amenities and things like that, but have privacy and a bit of a, a bit of a block with you know a few things on it. So when we build our forever home, I'd be doing the very similar system to this guy is actually having the fireplace in it where we can easily get wood because we're on those outskirts of the town and then also use all the electrical, mechanical, electrical things. And electricity is just one of those things that's so easy. I've got a lot of customers that are older and is one of those things going out and chopping firewood and fluffing about. It's just a whole headache. And when we built this house and we went all energy, we did everything electrical and um, yeah, basically, it was just amazing. To, it's so easy to get the morning. Just press the button, turn the air on, and it just heats heats the home. And we actually, we use some appliances in the house called Sensibo, which I can put a link down in the description below on Amazon um, to grab a couple of those. They're a really smart device, which can monitor the temperature of your home and things like that and, and keep it all on and off. And we've been playing around with a thing called um, Home Assist. So Google actually have a thing called Home Assistant. And there's another, another program called Home Assist, which is a, a little computer which you can put all your, your air cons, all your smart devices, your air cons, your electric cars, your solar system. And you can do things if, if, you know, like say for example, for us that if our battery is at 60 or 70% in the morning and we know the weather is going to be good that day, well, the, the device reads the weather and says, hey, well, Lismore's predicted a good weather day today. Let's heat the house up. Let's dump all the energy out of these batteries to get the house warm. So when, you know, everyone gets out of bed this morning, the house is nice and warm because we know later on today the sun's going to be cranking and we can just put all that energy back into the battery. And it can also say, well, you know, the house is down to 16 degrees. The weather's not really too good today. We've only got about 50% battery capacity. Maybe we'll just heat the house up to 18 degrees and we'll just use that technology and we'll use the smarts 
we'll just heat the house up to 18 degrees because 18 degrees feels a lot better than 16 and we're not going to use all that battery capacity. So there's a lot of smarts and stuff like that available out there in all this technology. So um, so yeah, so something to think about when doing design. And there's so many smarts available to do this stuff in the future and what's going on right now. So um, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of fun stuff to do. So yeah, guys, so that, that's sort of my, my thing. And if, if, when, if you're lucky enough to be able to build and like, personally, we've taken two houses off grid and we've, the, the first house in Sydney, we retrofitted and we worked with the gas and we knew it was our forever home. We did that. This house we've done here, the build we've done in Lismore, it was more about, I wanted to build a whole fully electric home. And, and some of the amazing things that we did, and we're going to start talking a lot about passive design homes moving forward in the future. Because it's actually, I always say to people when they call up and say, hey, Mike, I want to go off grid and I'm designing a home. And I always say, look, the best money spent, first of all, is the design of your house, then energy efficient appliances, because then your solar system becomes just lights, TVs and fridges overnight and things like that. And the way things are moving forward in the future, you know, it's charging electric cars and things like that. So if you can make your home really energy efficient, and that's one thing for our home that we get to cheat with, we put double glazing everywhere except for one window. And uh, that one window has actually been a happy little accident, which I'm going to show you when it gets in the middle of winter, of the difference in the performance of double glazing versus single glazed windows. I get a lot of people in the out architect says, ah, just don't worry about it, mate. Just put laminated windows in or to single glaze, double glazing is a waste of time. I will show you in the middle of winter the data. I've got a thermal imaging camera, but you also you'll see if anyone's got you know your windows and when the dew comes through that all your windows are wet and moist and they get dirty and annoying because they're always wet from the condensation because the heat of the inside of the house is transferring the outside of the house and that's what creates the condensation on the windows now for us in our home that one window is really bad because when it is really cold outside our house is really hot because we have double glazing everywhere else so that one window really shines and gets condensation all over it. and the, every other window in the house gets zero condensation because there's that break in the thermal bridge. So instead of, so we do have a thermal gap. So we've got the, the existing window and double glazing windows, they're probably more accurate to be called thermal breaks or thermal performance windows because you've got one bit of glass, you've got an air gap or a gas or whatever they decide to do. And then you've got another window so that the energy transfer, the bridge is broken. So the energy can't get from one side to the other. So the cold in or the heat can't get out. And, it's amazing in winter because the the glass will let the sunlight in. The sun comes through and heats your home up. But having that double insulation, there's that air gap in between won't let the heat back out, which really helps your home be more energy efficient. And um, yeah, so it's great. So just have a think about that stuff and um, of how, how it just really adds up and the best money spent is making your home more energy efficient. So um, cool. Well, guys, this morning I wanted to keep this short uh, for half an hour. Uh, has anyone got any questions? And like I said, every Friday I'm going to be doing this sort of stuff. If you do have any questions, want to jump up. Uh, this week we had a lot of questions about cooking, and that's why I thought I would do this. And um, yeah, and talk about the energy efficient cooking appliances. And it's also with the portable bench top stuff. If you want to go off grid or you're not too sure about induction cooktop, I'd highly recommend buy one, give it a go, and get a better quality one because the if you do all the reviews and look online, it's they all use about the same energy efficiency. It's the usability and how to use them. Like we went in the Millet one uh, and actually it scored like an 80 on the star rating. We're like, ah, oh, we'll, we'll get it because we had everything else Millet at the time. We're doing it. They're doing a deal. And um, it does do some stuff. Like it's really easy to turn up, really hard to turn down. Sometimes you sit something on it and it cranks up high. <laughs> so yeah, there's a few little things like that. So I'd highly recommend doing some research on the controllability and the usability of them. And like our Millet one now, it's like, it has to be, when did we build this house? um 18 so it's like five years old almost so i know they've come a lot way in the technology and how they operate in these days so think about that there when it comes to cooking and and yes yeah, so i'll give you a try to be able to play around that sort of stuff and see if um if you do like it so when you're going to build your forever home you're going to play around and test about it and you feel are building your forever home like i said the best money spent is the design your double glazing windows energy efficiency uh, you know, if you get, if you're lucky enough to be able to build a rammed earth or hemp or straw bale, um, we did do, we'll put the link in the description below. Uh, we did do a webinar on energy efficient homes and 
we did a Dixon home, which is like a big home builder, uh, a Dixon and a Metricon home. We're actually studying at the moment and recording all the information, and the data. And I was actually blown away. The customer did put insulation. They did do a few little things. Um, it they, they wasn't just a off the cuff Dixon home. Uh, and the things weren't major. You know, it was insulation. They moved a couple of windows for a bit of airflow to try and get that breeze to go through the house in the days of where the house was being built. Um, there wasn't much more than that. I was actually blown away of how energy efficient the home is. So we'll put the link in the video down below to see that data. So you can go in and see all the energy efficiency. And we've recorded this data on homes and we've been able to see the performance of these houses. So something to think about. So um, cool. All right, guys. Well, um, we haven't got any questions from that there. I'm going to finish it up. And yeah, so like I said, um, oh, we got one more question. Perfect. So Busman's about to move all the gas appliances to the motorhome and go full electric and well done. It's um, I always say to people that gas is finance because it is one of those things. Back in the day, you know, like five, six years ago, we just didn't have the, the technology that's available these days to, with the lithium batteries and also the appliances has been really energy efficient and affordable. I'd say a lot of the appliances have got more affordable. Batteries haven't got any cheaper. They've actually gone up. And a lot of the reasons batteries have gone up is the, the costs of transport. I wouldn't say the manufacturing. You'll see that, yeah, the, the manufacturing costs of batteries are coming down, but transport costs have gone up. Uh, something I got hammered with last year at Lismore with the floods. You know, like we, we were things that cost us 40 to $80 to send pr previous to the floods. After it cost me four or $500 to send the same thing. So that was a bit brutal. We had to make some changes there. So, um, so yeah, so that's where it comes down. So, yeah, so if you can go all full electric and get rid of that gas, and I would say... The way I think about in an off-grid situation, and I end on this, is I like to try and keep, if you're going to have a backup fuel source, keep the minimum amount of fuel sources. And as an example, if you're off-grid, completely off-grid, have a diesel generator. You know, most things these days at the moment, you have a diesel tractor, diesel, 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 or a petrol generator. Um, I'm actually probably more, I'm actually more of a fan of petrol generators because I've, I've played around a lot of hydrogen and you can actually reduce your fuel consumption from your petrol generator. You can do it with your diesel as well. Uh, you can actually add those products to a diesel generator. But you can actually have one fuel source as a backup. So when your batteries are flat and you still want to use your induction cooktop and heat your hot water from your electric backup, you turn in your generator on and your generators will be charging your batteries, heating your, um, heating your hot water, doing your cooking, all that sort of stuff. So you're having that one fuel source as a backup. And that's the way I like to think about it is just have minimal things and rather than have a diesel generator, gas cooking, gas backup, and that sort of stuff, just have... You know, turn the Jenny on, it's going to charge the batteries. I can do all my electrical stuff all in one go. So, um, yeah, well done and get off gas. So, cool. All right, guys. Well, uh, we're going to end it there. And like I said, yeah, so we're doing some competitions. You're going to some free merch. If you get over into YouTube and check out our community tab, uh, we're going to be posting a lot of data in, in these videos. We Something I've talked about from these videos, the girls are going to do and put up for the competition to win. So they'll post up the community tab. So next Friday, we're going to run it. And if you don't have to be live to, to win the prizes, just once we do it, you're going to want to have to watch the video because you can contact us and let us know. Say, hey, we'll tag you. you you've won, won something. Uh, but jump over onto the community page and we're going to put some quizzes up each week over there on the community page, a bit of engagement. And um, so hopefully we can e educate people because that's our number one intention. And, and next week, we've actually got... Um, We've got someone coming on to talk about local vaults, uh, which is a peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform. So you can actually buy and sell your own energy on the Australian network here in Australia. Uh, we're going to be talking about that there. And we're also going to reveal how much money we make off YouTube. Because uh, I know a lot of people think, you know, we make a million dollars and all that sort of stuff out of YouTube. And just want to sort of show you guys that to me, this is a real passion and it's a knowledge and education. It's the most important thing to me is that people get educated and understand. That's the reason we want to start the quizzes to see is everyone really getting this and are we really helping the broader community out there to get a knowingness and understanding of to take all the steps going off grid. So guys, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, we will see you next week until next time. Have a great day.